When I think of the goodness of Jesus, would you just think for a moment, let's just clear our mind of everything and just think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me and you. My soul. Now that's, some, that's getting down where it really counts. My soul cries out. Mm. Hallelujah. 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 Ah, ah. Hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. My mountain is growing. <laughs> oh, my, 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 my. Amen. I, I'm not sure what, uh, what all this really means, except I saw them just giving some of this away last night. That's exactly what happens to people sometimes. They suddenly think God has run out. What you need to do sometimes is just reach a little deeper. Yeah. Now, I know how many's in here, not by count, but just by feel, because I just had my hand down in there, but sometimes... You don't, you don't know. You just, you just by faith, you're reaching a little deeper. Hallelujah. But I promise you that God's supply will never run out. Hallelujah. Amen. That is one of the most amazing inventions. I don't know how they do Can you imagine the machine that does this? Now, th now the mistake a lot of people make is, is when they feel like they've hit bottom, they think that's it. They don't understand that there's more where that came from. If I can figure out how to get it open. <laughs> Before I do that, I saw one open here. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I think that I am, I am switching nights tomorrow night. Amen. So I'll be preaching tomorrow night instead of Thursday night. And uh, uh, you don't want to miss tomorrow night. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God, this, this thing is building. This is, this is not, uh, it's a conference, but this feels more like a, a revival to me. I feel you reaching for something in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't need to stop. We don't need to stop. And when this, when this week is over, you need to take home with you what you have received in this conference. I'm telling you, Brother Jonathan Downs last night absolutely was better than the fireworks on New Year's Eve in Sydney Harbor. My! What preaching. And, and you know what? I like, I like the passion that a preacher possesses when he believes what he's saying. Amen. Hallelujah. 
I have found years ago, I made up my mind years ago that I was going to be happy. Now, that's a choice that you make because life won't always give you everything to make you happy. But I made up my mind that I was going to be happy. And I found out something about being happy. People can't stay upset with you. They can't really argue with you too much if you just smile at them. Amen. When I go in the banks, I go in the grocery store, wherever I go, you know, the, 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 the one waiting on me or the cash register person or whatever, most of the time if they say anything to you, they don't even look up and look at you. They just, they're just going through the routine motion of life. And when they ask me, how are you today? I say, I'm happy. I have yet to have one of them not stop what they're doing and look at me. Because I have discovered in this world of great stress and pressure that everybody lives under, a happy person is a unique person. And people want to stop and look at somebody that's happy. Hallelujah. Well, amen. You can be as happy as you make up your mind to be. I refuse to be a victim. I refuse to be subject to, to the commands and instructions of the powers of this world. Hallelujah. Amen. I am a citizen of a heavenly place. Praise God. I'm going to tell you the truth. Amen. I do not look at you all together as Australians and I'm an American. I don't think of you, not since I've come to know you. Oh, no, I know on this realm of life we, we have all of these different countries and things and there's quite a, quite a representation in this congregation of nations of the world. Amen. But the truth is, my brother and my sister, when we repented of our sins and were baptized in the name of Jesus and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we all became citizens of one place. Hallelujah. And you are my brother and you are my sister. Hallelujah. And one of these days, we are going to stand around the throne of glory and we are going to see the one who died for us the one that we have loved we are going to crown him king of kings and lord of lords hallelujah and it's not going to matter the color of our skin or where we grew up or the citizenship of our country on this earth hallelujah amen we are going to be citizens forever of that heavenly place in the name of Jesus Oh, hallelujah. Praise. Hallelujah. Why don't you just give him some praise? He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. My, 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 my. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you will turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 1. And I want to begin reading with verse number 8. Amen. I want to talk about the church in this last day. The church in this last day. The Bible says in Daniel 1 and verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself now god had brought daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs and the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your face worse likening than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Amen. I want to talk and preach a little bit tonight about the church of this last day. Hallelujah. Put your Bibles down and let's make a joyful noise to the Lord and let's <laughs> praise Him with all of our heart. God, I want you to have your way in this house tonight. Oh, 
my God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. I feel something building every service. The preaching, Brother Jacobson, this morning. I commend you, sir, for such a clear sound. Hallelujah. Wow. What great preaching. Amen. I want to take that back home with me in the name of the Lord. Amen. I want to understand what I am supposed to be in this last bit of time left on this world. Amen. Amen. All of you, I'm sure, know the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Amen. I want to go back and lay a little bit of a foundation of the environment that Daniel was in while he was captive in Babylon. Amen. It was a significant occurrence in the spiritual realm when the king of Babylon rose up against Jerusalem, which was the city of God. We all know that. Amen. This took place in 605 B.C. Amen. There were, according to history, hundreds of young Jews who were taken captive and they were herded in chains across Syria to their new foreign strange home in Mesopotamia. It was a journey of horror for many of God's chosen people. Once they were in Mesopotamia, and once they were in the uh, kingdom of Babylon, they were divided into groups. Some of these were allowed to make a life for themselves in Babylon. Some of them were sent into cruel slavery. But for a group of young men, a select group who were set apart for the king's use, life was very different. They entered, these select Jews entered a three-year training program that would prepare them to serve in the king's palace. Now, these young men may have witnessed hundreds of their brethren being taken off in chains as slaves. You can only imagine the impression that it must have made upon their young minds. Amen. Surely those that were chosen for the king's service no doubt faced a strong temptation to please their new masters. They were set apart. They were special. They qualified uniquely. And so they had a strong temptation to please their new masters. Amen. The barbaric cruelty of the Babylonians was well known around the world. And the slightest infraction could bring the result of savage punishment. Amen. But the fear of Physical torture probably influenced these young men far less than the prospect facing them. And that was the training for the king's court. Babylon at this time in history was the greatest nation on the earth. And to serve in the king's court was considered the highest privilege that could be offered to one taken captive. And the power from the throne room of Nebuchadnezzar was fearful and it was intimidating and it was overwhelming. Who could resist this? Anyone who has been around powerful and influential people understands the pressure that there is on everyone to be accepted. To be accepted. Everybody wants the favor of the one in power. And it was into this setting that four young Jews named Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, 
and Abednego were thrown. They were selected in this group to serve in the king's palace. Amen. Now, I'm not going to dwell with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego tonight. You know their story. If you don't, it's a wonderful story to be found in the book of Daniel. Amen. But I do want to talk about Daniel tonight. For I think that he is a type of the church in my setting tonight. Daniel would do whatever he was told to do up to a point. Up to a point. Daniel refused to compromise God's commandments for all the riches and for all the opportunities of Babylon. Amen. That conviction characterized his life in Babylon for the next 70 years. He was a man of conviction. I have told my church at home many times. I, I, have, I have challenged them. I am concerned that the people of God are losing conviction. They're not familiar with conviction. If you don't have any conviction in your life, you need to pray that God would convict you of something and get to know what it feels like to put some boundaries in your life. We had a, a, a licensed counselor who, who was on our church staff for about four years. And she was a magnificent blessing to our church. And she taught a lesson to our staff one, one, uh, one gathering on, uh, on the importance of boundaries. And she, she said some things that, that blessed me and taught me a whole lot. She, she started out by saying, do you know the difference between a swamp and a river? A swamp and a river, the difference is boundaries. Without boundaries, a river has no force. It is the boundaries that give it its flow. It is the boundaries that cause it to be contained, therefore becoming a great force. I don't know the names of your rivers in this country, but perhaps you have heard of the Mississippi River in our country. It is a great river. I grew up on the banks of the Mississippi River in Memphis, Tennessee. The city sits right on the bluffs overlooking the Mississippi River. It is a mighty river. Its origin starts way up almost to the Canadian border of the United States. And up there, they tell me that you can step across the Mississippi River. It's just a small stream. But as it flows south, now here I would assume being on the opposite side of the equator, your rivers flow perhaps north. But our rivers flow south. And as the river flows south, other tributaries join it. And it has carved out a, 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 a track down through the United States. And uh, while the western half side is bigger than the east, it is pretty much a geographical division for our country. You can see it on a map. But the, but the more tributaries that join it, the river becomes a mighty force. And there's a lot of commerce that goes up and down that river. Amen. The only thing that makes it powerful and the only thing that gives it its force is that it has some restrictions. It has, if you please, some convictions. Amen. And there are times when the, the elements uh, cause it to get out of its bank. And when it gets out of its bank, the current is lost at that point. It, everything becomes just swampy. Amen. That's a tragedy when you, when you meet somebody's life like that. When you find people in the church who have no conviction. They have no force, no flow in their life. They don't even know where they're headed. They don't know how they're going to get there. Amen. I had a man, a businessman some years ago after we built our new church and relocated out of the downtown part of Dallas into the suburbs. I had a businessman come by. He wanted to take me to lunch one day and uh, uh, I had never met him. He came by two or three times. Finally, I agreed to go to lunch with him. 
And he told me, he said, sir, he said, I don't think you realize what you've got sitting on that property. Amen. He talked about the, the building. I had given him a tour of the building. And he talked about all these things. And uh, he kept saying, I don't think you realize what you've got here. Amen. I don't think you realize the potential that you have. And I finally stopped him. I said, I don't know where you're wanting to go with this conversation. But I want to tell you, I know exactly what I've got here. I know how I got here. I know how I'm going to persevere here and I know where we're going hallelujah amen and I'm not interested in anything that you're trying to offer me that's not going to help me get to where I need to be in the Holy Ghost amen I want you to know that boundaries are important and if you don't have any conviction in your life you don't have any flow in your life you don't have any force amen there needs to be hallelujah if you are building on the foundation of of Jesus Christ he's the chief cornerstone amen if you're building on the foundation of the apostles and prophets let me tell you a little something there is a limit to how wide you can go amen there is a limit to, to just how far out you can build if you're going to build on a foundation you've got to build upon the foundation amen when we built our new church we poured a beam concrete beam around the perim perimeter and we put piers out in the middle 155 Piers we poured in that in that dirt. In every pier, there is a steel column that sits on top of it. And the building sits on this beam around. Amen. The building is is is, is large. It's about uh, 200 feet wide and, and about 200 and something feet long. And, and it's it's a big building. I'm gonna tell you, it would have been a tragic mistake for us to have tried to put a building 300 feet wide and 350 feet long on the foundation that was not designed for something that wide. Amen. Hear me right now. When you begin to live for Jesus Christ, you're going to realize some convictions are in your life and there's going to have to be some boundaries and some limits to what you do. Hallelujah. But if you're willing to stay on the foundation, amen, there is no limit to how high you can go. Amen. For the foundation is solid. Amen. It is built on this book. It's not going to be moved. Hallelujah. You let the elements of life come against you. And as long as you're built on the rock of this church, amen, you will survive. Jesus made it clear when he said, amen, upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of a hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. I've told you every night. That I preached. I don't pray to the devil. But I talk to him sometimes when I'm praying. He comes to every church service. I cannot get him to miss. His attendance pen is about that long. He never misses a service. He doesn't miss a prayer meeting. He doesn't miss a gathering of the saints. He's always there. And when I am in prayer. Sometimes I talk to him. And I tell him, I remind him of his end. Amen. I remind him that, that he is not going to prevail against the church. He cannot have a family in our church. Amen. When I've got a family in trouble, I go to prayer and I start I start rebuking him with everything that's within me. Let me tell you something, child of God. You've got more authority than you realize in the realm of the Holy Ghost. And we need to wake up to what is available to us in the spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me tell you something. Uh, you, you, take, you take Brother Robert Fuller who's traveling with me on this trip. He what used to be a police officer. Now, he's a pretty good-sized guy. But they've got some, some ladies in our city that are officers. And some of them are, are just little bitty things. They couldn't stop a car. They, they couldn't, they couldn't. But you, you, you know what they can do? They can walk, drive up to the scene of, of an accident out in traffic. And they can park their car and turn their lights on and, and all of that. And you know what? That little lady in that uniform can walk right out in the midst of traffic and put her hand up and everything stops. Do you know why? 
It's not because of her. It's because of the badge that she wears and the uniform that she wears and the authority that she represents. And if you don't obey her, there's grave consequences to that. Amen. I'm telling you, I can prove with the word of God, amen, that you've got some legal authority. Amen. And if you will apply the blood, amen, and if you will command the name of Jesus over some situations, hallelujah, if you will take some authority, hallelujah, amen, you are the head, you are not the tail. Amen. You do not have to take what the devil dishes out. You need to control the situation, amen, and say, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I'm taking back everything that you've tried to take from me. You've tried to take my marriage. You've tried to take my children. Amen. You can't have them. Do you hear me? You cannot have them. Amen. I'm pleading the blood. I'm not going to let you have your way in my life, and I'm not going to let you run havoc in my church. Amen. We are the people of God. And we're going to stand firmly on the foundation of the word of God. And we will not be moved. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the people of God who make up the church. Ah. Dear God, that makes me want to just talk in tongues. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. We've got authority and we have power. Amen. And the Lord is with us in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, Daniel was in this situation. Amen. Many years passed in the life of Daniel. Amen. The kingdom of Babylon saw several rulers come and go, and Daniel was there. Eventually, there was a king by the name of Belshazzar, one of Nebuchadnezzar's grandsons, who came to the throne, and he became the king of Babylon. Amen. And one fateful day, a courier brought to Daniel an announcement from the new king about a great banquet that was going to be thrown. Amen. Every important person, every nobleman, every dignitary in the land and in the kingdom was going to be there. Amen. It was going to be the equivalent in our country of a White House dinner party. I don't know what you call your, your, your government houses here, but when your prime minister hosts a, a dignitary and they put on these big banquets and all the important uh, government officials show up, amen, it's, it's a big thing. And, and uh, uh, they, they, they do these in, in, in governments, and you no doubt read about them when they're held here. Amen. This was the equivalent. This was the biggest thing that could be held. Amen. Unknown to Belshazzar, the king, it would be his last meal. It would be his last meal. For at that very moment, while he was planning the banquet, Darius the Mede had diverted the Euphrates River way upstream. And when it was about, he was about to bring his Persian army into Babylon through the river gate. Amen. Eating and drinking wine at Belshazzar's feast is an illustration of living the full life on earth, oblivious to the, to the pending judgment that is on its way. I'm telling you that I believe we are living in the last days. I have never seen a time that is so much a blueprint of what we are read, told in the book of uh, in the Bible about the end time and all that's shaping up. Up. Folks, uh, it's shaping up quickly to a one world government, to a system that's going to take over. Amen. And the world is oblivious to it. People think life has never been better. Amen. In our country, amen, they, 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 they've got 
got an entitlement mentality. They just think we're entitled to everything. Amen. And, and, and you don't really have to work. You don't have to worry. You don't have to care anymore. Amen. The government's going to just take care of you and it's just going to go on forever without ending. Amen. That's the attitude of our day. God help us to understand where we are in time. Amen. It was Jesus that, uh, that, that predicted. It was what he said in, in, the, in the book of Luke when he wrote in the 17th chapter of Luke, verse 26, Jesus said, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also it was as it, as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they brought, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. Amen. A lot of people think that it was altogether just the immoral situation. I'm telling you that Jesus said life was going on at a pretty good clip. Everybody was in abundance. Everything was good. Nobody could see anything changing. Babylon is a picture of life in the world system as we have it today outside of God. Amen. When the Bible says to love not the world, amen, the word world there comes from the Greek word cosmos. It talks about this world system. Love not the world system. Neither the things that are in the world system. If any man love the world system, the love of the Father is not in him. Amen. Babylon was that kind of situation. That's why Revelation talks about Babylon in the end time and the spirit of Babylon that's going to be in this earth. Amen. It is a life dominated by self-will and self-sufficiency and self-indulgence. It is also a life that can be very intoxicating and almost irresistible even for people in the church. Folks, we've got to fine-tune our faith. We've got to shake ourselves. Amen. I was preaching to my church some months ago. Amen. And I was talking about some examples. Uh, we have some examples in the Bible of what people do to get into the anointing. And I got to talking about the man Samuel. Amen. Now, I may step on your theology. And if I do, forgive me. I'll be gone in a few days. And you can keep just believing what you want to believe. Uh, amen. But I'm going to tell you that when, when, when desperate times arrive for Samson, do you know what he said? He said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. That Samson knew how to bring the anointing on him. This was what I was telling my church. Amen. We, we have so many people that are indifferent to a move of God. Amen. We remember the old days of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost would move in a service and people would respond. Amen. They would get with it. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. If you're not a worshiper and if you have no demonstrative relationship to Jesus Christ, if you don't feel anything ever, amen, Amen. Don't be surprised when your children are disinterested in the church. Don't be surprised when they no longer care about the things of God. Hear me right now. Don't expect a Sunday school teacher to teach them holiness. Don't expect a pastor to teach them how to live for God. Amen. You are their mother and you are their father. Hallelujah. If you want them to be a worshiper, they need to see you be a worshiper. Hallelujah. They need to see you respond to the Holy Ghost. They need to see you slain in the spirit. They need to see you dance a little bit. They need to see you stand up and shout hallelujah. They need to see you get with it in the Holy Ghost. I can't tell you as a pastor how frustrated I get sometimes when good saints come to me and they say, oh, pastor, that was a great message. I'm telling you, I felt God in that message. I, I, I sat there. I, I wanted to get up and just dance a little bit. And when they say that, I just want to reach across the desk and slap them. I say, why didn't you do that? 
You know what, what, what you are feeling? You are feeling the unction of God. You hear me right now. We are living in the spirit of Babylon, this age. Hallelujah. We better make up our mind who we are. We better purpose some things in our life. Hallelujah. When I go to the house of God, we need to develop the attitude, Brother Downs, like David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. All you got to do is just give me a chance in the house of the Lord because I'm going for one purpose. I'm going to lift him high. I'm going to praise him with all of my might. I'm going to give him praise and glory. He's worthy of everything that I could possibly do. I'm telling you. Amen. Don't wait till your kids are 15, six years old, 16 years old and ask, Pastor, I need to have a meeting with you. I feel like the church has failed my family. I feel like the church has not done what it's supposed to do. I think, I think we ought to, you ought to get me a better Sunday school teacher for those classes. Matter of fact, Pastor, you ought to, you ought to preach a little harder and a little straighter. Let me tell you, it's too late. Amen. You want your children to be givers? I taught my kids when they were little boys. I tried to do everything that a parent should do. I opened up an education fund for their college when the week they were born. I went down and put some money in an account, opened it up. And I'm telling you, it was a great blessing when they went to college. That account had grown. Every month I had put money in that account. Had a, had a little bit of money in there. When I went to college, I didn't have enough, but I had a little bit to help along the way. But you know what? In addition to that, when my kids were young, I, I gave them a little bit of money every week. I'd give them allowance. They had some, some chores they had to do around the house, some things they needed to do. And I'd give them an allowance. It might not be but 25 cents or a quarter of a dollar. As they got a little older, it increased. But you know what they had to do with that? Every week, if they got a dollar allowance, they had to take one dime of that, put it in an envelope, and mark tithe. Because I explained to them that one-tenth of everything that you have, every, any, it's not just what you earn. Anything that is an increase to you, you owe God 10 cents of it. Matter of fact, it's like a bill. It's not an offering. It's not a gift. It's a debt. You owe it. Amen. I taught my kids to do that. Amen. And I have lived to reap the benefit of it in their life. I've watched them. You know what? My oldest son now is going to be 27 years old the end of this month. My youngest son is 22. They're grown men now. You know what? I'm still their father. I still make sure they pay their tithe. I got to make sure the teaching sticks. You want to be givers? You be a giver. You be a giver. Amen. I've always paid my tithe and I've given to missions. Now, I've asked the church, I've asked members of my church for two offerings. For two offerings. Matter of fact, Maybe this will bless some pastor here. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just kind of crazy. But I told our church years ago, I said, let me tell you something. For every dollar we spend on ourselves as a church, we're going to give one dollar to missions. I'll never forget in our first building project, 
we spent about $950,000. And I'll never forget the rejoicing that came up from the congregation the Sunday that I stood and told them, folks, your missions giving this Sunday is going to put us beyond what we have spent on ourselves. We will give more, have given more money to missions than we paid to build the building. Hallelujah. Since then, I went into another building program. Brother Fuller was a major part in that. He was one of my major players on the building committee. Amen. We spent about $4.6 million on that building. We borrowed $4 million. Amen. I have a big payment every month. But let me tell you something. The first thing I did was I stood before our church the night they voted. I, the only time I've got a 100% vote on anything was when we voted to borrow that much money. They voted 100% to borrow that money. And I told them, I said, you know what this means, don't you? It means that we owe God four million more dollars in the work of the Lord. Not to heap it on ourselves, Not to just make our life more comfortable. Amen. But we're going to have to sacrifice. Amen. We're going to give it to the work of God. I'm one million dollars into that now. In Jesus name. Hallelujah. When I built my building, I never cut a missionary. I never quit supporting missions. Amen. As a matter of fact, we've increased our giving. Hallelujah. We have more missionaries that we're supporting now than ever in the history of our church. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you what, what it took me 10 years to pay off the land. I'm paying that much every year in payments. Amen. I paid 330000 I borrowed $280,000 to buy our land. And I am paying right at $300,000 a year in property payments now. Amen. I, I, and you say, well, I tell you what, boy, he must have a rich church. I don't have any wealthy people in my church. I've got people that do well, but I don't have any wealthy people. I don't have any family that I'm worried, oh, God, if they leave me, we can't survive. Amen. It's everybody doing their part. It's everybody being faithful. Hallelujah. It's that little woman that doesn't have much, but she play, pays her her tithe and she gives five dollars a month to missions and she gives five or ten dollars a month to the building fund I've asked them for two offerings and to pay their tithe and they have bought into that and God has blessed hallelujah and I'm telling you tonight my purpose is every time I get to the house of God I'm expecting God to be there I'm expecting the glory of the Lord amen all I gotta have is one more person show up in the name of the Lord amen I just need out of the beautiful congregation that God's given us of several hundred I just need one person to come in the name of the Lord that man right there always meets me in the house of God in the name of the Lord hallelujah Jesus said where two or three are gathered in my name I'll be there I'll be there hallelujah amen I expect God to be there hallelujah Amen. You want to be a giver? You want your children to be a giver? You be a giver. Amen. You, you want your children to love holiness? You love holiness. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't, don't, don't. now this is a, this is a, 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 a some sort of a, I don't know, a phrase that we use. But don't sit there like a knot on a log. I mean, you know what that means. You can stare at a knot on a log all day long, it won't move. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you right now, if everybody in this house would just do a little more than you've done tonight, if you just do a little more, if, 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 if you've sat during the singing and tapped your finger to the music, if you just do a little more, just clap a little bit. If you've clapped a little bit, hey amen. Maybe you ought to stand to your feet. If you've stood to your feet, maybe you ought to stomp your feet. If you've stomped your feet, maybe you ought to get out and, 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 and jump a little bit. Hallelujah. 
Amen. You see, you see, we're falling. If we're not careful, we're falling as a result of this system that we're in. We're waiting on God to make the first move. And I'm telling you, in the spirit realm, it does not work that way. Hallelujah. Amen. You go after God. You pursue him. Hallelujah. Why don't you try something right now that you haven't done in this house tonight in a form of worship? Hallelujah. Why don't you just give a little worship to God and let God have his way? Hallelujah. Wave your hand, lift your voice, clap, dance, run, whatever you got to do. Hallelujah. We want the glory of the Lord to be in our midst. I expect Jesus to be here. Let me tell you something. Some years ago, I was preaching for a church in Houston, Texas. You can sit down. Preaching for a church in Houston, Texas. And when I got through preaching, I'd watched a man on about the second or third row. He hadn't moved. He hadn't responded. It's like he wanted everybody to know how miserable he was. Hey Amen. You pastors probably got somebody in your church that blesses you like that every once in a while. They come in carrying the weight of the world and they want everybody to know they're carrying the weight of the world. Amen. So when I began to move into the altar service of that night, the pastor left the platform and went down to this man. Come to find, I didn't know the man. Come to find out this man had recently received the Holy Ghost. And he was there and the chips were down. He was a sad sack. He was distraught. And, and he just, he just run into the realities of life. You know, let me tell you something. Just because you get the Holy Ghost doesn't mean you're never going to have any challenges anymore. Matter of fact, I read about the promised land. I read about Canaan land. Brother Hall, I found a scripture in Deuteronomy that said that Canaan land was a land of hills and valleys. Now, the Canaan land is a type of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I got a hold of that mess verse one day and preached the fire out of that. Amen. I told my church, when you get in Canaan land, you still got hills and valleys. But there's a wonderful conclusion to the verse. Amen. It says it's a land of hills and valleys. And Brother Slack, it also goes on to say that the eyes of the Lord are upon them all. God sees you when you're in the valley. God sees you when you're on the mountain. Let me tell you something. Amen. You get to thinking you want to stay on the mountain all your life. Amen. You can't have a mountain without a valley on each side of it. Amen. If you have a mountain with no valley, you're just on a plateau somewhere. Hallelujah. But let me give you an assurance. Oh, no matter where you are in the Holy Ghost, God knows exactly where you're at. And he'll be with you. Stay in the promise. Don't leave the promise. God will stay with you. The eyes of the Lord know exactly where you are. This pastor went down to this man and I could see I could see whatever this man told him it just kind of went all over this pastor. I saw, I saw a little bit of frustration in the man of God and he talked to him a little bit and then he came up and got a microphone and he got the attention of all the church. And he told him, he said, this brother just got the Holy Ghost so many weeks back and said he's having a real struggle, having some problems at home, all of this, and, 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 and he doesn't know whether it's worth it. And he's come here and he hadn't felt a thing. I mean, we were having a great altar service. He hadn't felt a thing. That bothers me when somebody can sit in the house of God and not feel a thing. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you right now, if you're in this house and you haven't felt the presence of God yet, amen, we need to lay hands on you. We need to pray you out of that state of mind. Hallelujah. For the Spirit of the Lord is here and if you just open yourself up to the spirit of the Lord do you know what you'll find in the Holy Ghost you'll find that there's liberty hallelujah there is great liberty in the spirit of the Lord so this pastor talked to him a minute and then told him he said now we're going to pray and you could tell this pastor felt like he'd given him some excellent instruction and it was good 
Amen. So he laid the microphone down and he took the man by the, both hands and he began to pray for him. And the man just stood there. And that pastor was praying up a storm. And finally that pastor peaked. Pastors, every once in a while you need to peek. He picked that microphone back up and he said, Brother, he said, the Bible says to leap for joy. It doesn't say that when you get joy, you'll leap. If you want joy, leap. Leap for joy. So he laid the microphone back down. He said, let's pray again. And the pastor grabbed him by the hands and the pastor began to leap and began to pray. And he peeked. And the man was just standing there. <laughs> this time, the pastor didn't need a microphone. He looked at him. He said, brother, he said, God filled you with the Holy Ghost. You spoke in other tongues. If you want the experience to be alive in you, do what the Word of God says. He said, I don't need to leap. I've got joy. You need to leap and get some joy. Amen. And he began to pray with him again. And the pastor began to leap. And that man just kind of began to flex his knees a little bit. Now, if you don't want to get to feeling nothing, that's a dangerous thing to do. Hey, let me tell you something. If you don't want to feel God, don't raise your hand and wave it a little bit here. Don't clap your hand. Don't shout hallelujah. Don't, don't, don't whisper amen under your breath. Amen. Don't even dare mention Jesus. Amen. Because when you do, he'll be right there. Hallelujah. Amen. You hear what I'm telling you right now. My God. Amen. That man began to, began to move a little bit. And in just a minute, like a bolt of lightning, the anointing of the Lord touched him. And he went to spinning like a top. Hallelujah. He began to run and began to shout and began to dance. Hallelujah. Amen. You got to make up your mind. You're not going to let the world system spirit override you or press you down. Yeah. Ha. Hallelujah. You can be seated just a bit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. It can be easy for believers to become intimidated. Amen. It can be easy for us to be, you know, you know, there are seasons that come through a church. And there are seasons that come to your life. Amen. I've watched it. I, I, we, when, when we moved into our new building, we experienced an incredible revival. Our church began to grow. And we had bought 400 chairs. And uh, we, we, we realized right fast we didn't have near enough chairs. We, had to buy, we were out of money, but we had to buy more chairs. And, and our building, we were in the gymnasium, and it began to fill up. We hadn't built the new building yet. It began to fill up until eventually our, our gymnasium became completely full. And our services were wonderful. And, and uh, it was an incredible event. And I, I, I wouldn't take anything for the experience. Uh, amen. But... but there, there are people sometimes who, who don't understand the seasons of God. There are seasons. There's a season of harvest. There's a season of sowing. Amen. I'm going to tell you what I preach to my church and what I believe with all of my heart. Everybody that attends my church expects me to feel called. How many of you expect your pastor to feel called to the church that he's pastoring? Isn't that a comforting feeling? When he feels called? Matter of fact, you, you, you get a little restless if, if you don't think he feels called anymore. Well, I preach at home that just as saints ought to expect a pastor to feel that he's there called of God to be there, I believe that saints need to feel called to a church. I, you know, you, know you, you, can't, you can't just bounce around where the shouting's the loudest and they're jumping the highest and, 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 and when, the, when, it, when it stops there and it's happening, you, you pick up and move up there. You're not worth anything. Nobody can build anything with you. 
But when you, when you get under it, when you bow to the burden of a local assembly, when you get there with your pastor and you say, Pastor, I'm here. You can count on me. I'll be in the prayer room. I'm going to be around the altar. I'm whatever you want. Hallelujah. When the revival is, is falling fast and heavy and when we're going through a lean time and maybe not seeing much, I'm going to be here. Amen. Nothing's going to change. God's still with us. Amen. The season will come back. Hallelujah. Do you hear me? The season will come back. Amen. Amen. You got to understand that. Hallelujah. If you persevere, if you'll pray, if you'll be a worshiper, if you'll be a giver, if you'll be faithful, God will honor your effort and revival will come. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. In the analogy of Babylon, amen, the world is in a feast. The world is in a feast and the spirit of Antichrist is the Babylonian king that is giving it. Amen. Do you hear me? Amen. I don't know if who the Antichrist is. I personally believe that he already exists and is somewhere on this earth. I don't know who he is, but I believe we are that close to the end time. Amen. But I'm going to tell you that the spirit of Antichrist has been in the world all through this church age. Amen. The spirit of it, we have fought it. Amen. Daniel's life is an example for every one of us. Daniel lived in Babylon without being tainted by its spirit or seduced by its glass. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This is still true in the church world today. The overwhelming majority lives day and night for the flesh gratifying way that life is offered in Babylon. Amen. Even people in the church, they don't realize how caught up they are in the spirit of Babylon. Amen. A lot of folks may outwardly call themselves Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, but their hearts and their lifestyle clearly show a different priority. Amen. Their social life contradicts their profession of faith. Amen. It's a sad thing if, if, if you don't know, if somebody doesn't know who you are. Amen. When you're out in public, you need to be identified as a child of God. Amen. I cannot tell you how it happens to me often. Amen. Somebody, well, when your wife, my wife is very apostolic. Her hair nearly touches the floor. It's never been cut. Amen. She is a beautiful lady, and I thank God that she's my partner for life. Amen. And I thank God for her conviction and for her stand. Amen. But I have been many times by myself and in standing at a checkout line or standing conversing with somebody, at some point they will say, what do you do for a living? And I'll say, what do you think I do? And they'll say, well, I'm not sure, but could it be that you're a preacher? There is something transmitted. Amen. Amen. People who don't even go to church, they can sense something in this Holy Ghost. Amen. Don't allow your, your life to be tainted by the spirit of this world or don't let it be seduced by the events of this world. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul recognized these kind of people in the church of his day. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 18, says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Amen. Amen. They Thank God there are still people, hallelujah, who choose the narrow path of the cross and they are identified by the Lord Jesus as the chosen few. Matthew chapter 20, amen, the word of the Lord says, so the last shall be first and the first last for many are called but few are chosen. Hallelujah, amen, those who fit this category are not going to be found gorging themselves at the table of the king of Babylon when the master returns. Instead, they're going to be ushered into the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is a feast coming for the people of God, but it's not to be found in the things of this world, but it is going to happen as soon as we are raptured. Hallelujah. Holy living and a love for others 
will characterize their lives in this Babylonian environment. Now, whether King Belshazzar invited Daniel to the feast or not, we don't know. What we do know is that he didn't go. He didn't go. Daniel was not interested in attending a self-indulgent feast of the flesh. I don't know what he did. Maybe he stayed home purposely that night to spend time seeking God. Perhaps he was reading scriptures by candlelight in his room, studying the life of Joseph in Potiphar's house. Or maybe he was going over the story of Elijah. We heard it put so powerfully last night by Brother Downs. Amen. Elijah's confrontation with Ahab. Amen. Maybe he's reading about what Elisha did and how the events concerning Jezebel were handled. Amen. I do want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. Amen. It is interesting that when the handwriting appeared on the wall in that banquet hall, the queen knew who to call. Anybody that was somebody and all the servants that had been groomed to serve the king, Jews, people of God, none of them that were at that banquet Nobody sought their help. Nobody sought the help of any Jew who was trying to appease the king of Babylon. They had lost their spiritual credibility. By attending the banquet... When the crisis moment came, nobody turned to them for instruction. Amen. The need of the moment called for a man of God. A man who would not and had not compromised and had not forgotten his godly conviction. And when Daniel was summoned and when he showed up, immediately this great King Belshazzar began to offer him everything imaginable. I'm going to tell you, September 11, 2001 in the United States, the Twin Towers of New York City fell. You know, the, you know it. Everybody around the world talks about 9-11. I'm going to tell you, I've watched America decline in spiritual things over my lifetime. And it's been sad until now they don't want the Ten Commandments posted anywhere and they don't want prayer made in any public places. And it is amazing that there are more religious freedoms in the old Soviet Union than there are now in America. But I'm going to tell you, after 9-11, I saw the frivolity of, of, of all that kind of thinking. Nobody, nobody declined or wanted to stop anybody from praying. Nobody cared where you posted the Ten Commandments. Nobody cared because there was a crisis in the land and everybody suddenly realized we're not near as strong and infallible as we think we are. We're not nearly as independent as we think we are. Amen. We need help from God. We need help. We're under attack. We need help. Hear me. Amen. In this world, I, I, don't, I don't look forward to crises. I try to pray those things away. I want to keep things as safe for my church and for my society as I can. I don't want anything bad to happen to your country. I don't want anything bad to happen to the churches here. I don't want anything like that to happen. But I'm going to tell you, amen, you'd be surprised. We think sometimes this is an ungodly nation. We think America's an ungodly nation. You'd be surprised. You let a crisis bigger than the government can handle happen and you'll be surprised how quickly
quickly. Everybody wants to hear from God. Everybody wants somebody to tell them what to do. Amen. It could be that we are at about to see our finest hour. Hallelujah. The revival God's going to send. Amen. Could come through a crisis moment. You need to be ready. Don't find yourself sitting at the banquet table enjoying the spirit of Babylon when the crisis moment comes. You need to be finding yourself in the house of God talking about the things of God. Hallelujah. Hear me in Jesus. Amen. God help us. God help us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Belshazzar said, I'll give you anything. Amen. Daniel 5, verse 16. He said, I have heard of thee. What an indictment. The king said, I've heard of thee. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how well known you are, United Pentecostal Church in Australia. I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now, if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. Daniel was not interested in what the king of Babylon had to offer. And neither should we. He could not be bought. And neither should we. The world right at this moment is in a Belshazzar feast. And they don't even know it. Rubbing elbows with those of the world at the same party are many people who have at one time known the power of the name of Jesus Christ but are both in the world and now of the world. They're not going to be able to help the world. Let me tell you, you you don't ever help the world by stepping down to their level. They are deluded as they cheerfully propose one toast after another, becoming more intoxicated with the things of the world with every passing minute. Many years ago, when I was quite young, there was a movement that came through our country and it it reached around the world called the Charismatic Revival. Let me tell you what was wrong with the Charismatic Revival. It had no altar of repentance. It required no change. It would not identify sin as sin. Therefore, it had a major flaw in it from the beginning. And many have pursued it to eventually lose completely out with God. Amen. This is why you better get some conviction. If you don't have a conviction, your next prayer meeting needs to be, Lord, give me a conviction. Give me a conviction. Amen. Because you see, for a long time, everything was going great. Everything was going their way. Amen. Amen. Belshazzar's feast was indeed the gala celebration of the century until that hand appeared on the wall and began to write a message. Verse 26 of Daniel 5, this is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. God said that. To kill, thou art weighed in the balance and and art found wanting. There is, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. The party goers were almost completely intoxicated. They were beyond their ability to understand that it was their last night 
to party. Like the people in Noah's day, they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And little did they realize that within moments, just a few moments, Belshazzar would be dead and Babylon would fall and the entire kingdom would be turned upside down. Amen. Jesus gave us this warning in Matthew 24. So likewise, in verse 33, so likewise ye, when ye shall, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. But you see, right now there's still time to escape. Amen. But we have, we have come to a place, I believe, as a church. We've come to a place in man's history where the battle lines are clearly delineated. They are clearly defined, clearly formed. There was a clarion shout that went out in the Old Testament. Who? is on the Lord's side. I'm telling you, neutrality is no longer an option. Setting on the fence, y'all say that down here, setting on the fence? Setting on the fence won't work anymore. You need to declare yourself. Hallelujah. You can't go to the judgment with a bunch of excuses. That's not going to work. You need to declare whose side you're on. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you something I've observed. Anybody that gets full of the Holy Ghost, they don't ever make a good sinner anymore. They don't know, they don't know how to go out and be a good sinner. They make a flop of everything they try to do. Amen. Who is on the Lord's side? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The fulfillment of John's words are upon us. In 1 John 2, verse 17, And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We don't need superficial religion. We don't need patty cake sermons. We don't need to be trying to find a lesser way or an easier way. We need to be praying that God will purge us, that God will release us from the things of this world. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I, 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 I was in prayer some, some years ago, and this, this hit me like a, a brick wall. Amen. I, I was thinking, oh, God, I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be lost. God, I can't think of anything worse than dying and going to hell. And then all of a sudden I felt something in the spirit and said, oh yeah, there's something worse than you dying and going to hell. I've given you two boys. The thing that would be worse than you dying and going to hell would be for them to meet you in hell and say, Dad, what did you do? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you ch challenge me? Why didn't you correct me? Why didn't you get my attention? Hallelujah. Amen. Right after that, the next Sunday, I got all I got all of my family together in the house of God, right down at the front. Amen. I told the church. I pointed to my wife, who's a beautiful, holy woman, an apostolic woman. Amen. I told my wife. I said, "Some of you are not an example of what I believe. Some of you do not live like I teach. But if you want to know what I believe, you look at my wife. This is what I believe. This is how I think a woman ought to look. This is how I think she ought." 
to dress. This is how I think she ought to appear in public. This is how I think. If you want to know what I believe is a pastor, look at her. Amen. I called my two boys down. They were teenagers at that time. Amen. I got them between my wife and me. Amen. And I preached to my boys in front of the church that there was nothing. I didn't care what they ever did for a living. I didn't care about how much money they made. Life is not comprised of the things that you can gain. This is not a game. Amen. It's not who wins with the most toys at the end. Amen. Amen. The thing that they've got to do. If I am to be a success, the thing they've got to do is to live for God. To be full of the Holy Ghost. To have some conviction about right and wrong. Amen. If they'll do that, then I will have lived a successful life. Amen. Now let me tell you something. If you've got children that aren't serving the Lord, amen, don't you give up on them. Do you hear me? Don't you give up on them. I don't care if they're grown and out of the house. I don't care if they don't ever say anything good or kind about the church. You don't go. You don't give up on them. I'm going to tell you, they may shun your testimony. They may not want to listen to your words, but they cannot stop your praying. They cannot stop your praying. You can send angels to them. Hallelujah. I want a revival in Australia of backsliders. I want people to make their way back to apostolic altars. I want us to see the fires burn in every soul that's had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I'm telling you, the closer I get to the coming of the Lord, the less I feel at home in this world. Amen. I'm going to join the revelator and say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You hear me right now. If you don't like loud church, if you don't like shouting and worshiping, you're not going to like heaven at all. Heaven's going to be a noisy place. Let me tell you something. There ain't, a, there ain't nobody that's going to get to heaven when they step through the gate and when it dawns on them, if this is possible, if it dawns on them that they have made it. I mean, they made it. If they didn't, I don't know how anybody can get to that point and not already know this going, but if there would be somebody, you cannot tell me that they are going to just stand passively by and just look at he who died for them and just think, oh, isn't that lovely? Amen. Isn't this all sweet? This is so pretty. Amen. Let me tell you. Amen. When it dawns on you that you have stepped through the pearly gates of that city. Amen. And your feet touch streets of gold. Hallelujah. And you make your way to the throne. Amen. There's going to be a shout of victory that's going to rise in your voice. Amen. You're going to worship God like you never worshiped him in all this earth. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you've got a backslidden child or an unsaved husband, some family member, they've had the Holy Ghost and they're not living for God, I don't know what. If, if you've got, you got members of your family that aren't living for God, I want you to get a fixation in your mind of what you want to see. I want you to, I want you to see them with tears running down their face. I want you to see them with their hands lifted as high as they can lift them. I want you to see them dancing in the Holy Ghost. Don't see them as they are. See them as you want them to be. And I want you to claim it. I want you to claim the revival for your family. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. 
Brother Downs is going to give me some reports in months to come of revival in churches, revival across this land. Hallelujah. Folks, are you ready for God to do something bigger than you've ever dared imagine? Are you ready for your churches to be full? Are you ready for the Holy Ghost to demonstrate His power in your church and in your life and in your family? Amen. Come on, crank up your faith. Get a hold of God. Don't believe the words of the enemy. Don't buy into this world system. Amen. Hallelujah. We're not going to the banquet hall. We're not going to the invitation of the king. But we are going to serve our God with all of our heart. Ha! My God. My God. My God. Everybody in the house, reach over to somebody. Take them by the hand or put your hand on their shoulder. Pray right now. Pray the glory of the Lord on your friend, on your neighbor. Pray right now from the front to the back. God, give us a revival. God, stir us. God, keep us. God, do for us what we're not able to do for ourselves. God, we're going to pray. We're going to worship. We're going to believe you. In Jesus' name, we don't want the spirit of this world. Amen. The church in this last day is a church not sitting at the banquet table of the enemy, but we are waiting on you. We're waiting on the coming of the Lord. Come on! Ah.